section one of the man who understood women and other stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Fallis. The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories by Leonard Merrick. Section 1 Introduction by William J. Locke. One of our most delightful novelists has recently written a preface to a collection of his short stories in which he apologizes for disinterring them from magazines and resuscitating them in book form. I think he ought not to have done it. If a preface were needed, it should have been written rather as an appeal than as a warning. It should have been in the nature of a bugle-blast. It should have said, in effect, Hear my faithful and gentle readers who, owing to the limitations of time and space and the worries of the world have missed much of my best and most cherished work here is an opportunity of an unexpected feast i confess that such an appeal would not have been modest and the author in question is the most modest of our confraternity but the assertion would have been true now with the agreeable task before me of writing a preface to another man's collection i am not bound by any such sense of modesty and i should like to make clear once more certain issues which my friend above referred to has to a certain extent confused in the first place it must be understood that the novel and the short story are two entirely distinct artistic expressions as different as the great oil painting and the miniature and as rarely as the accomplished landscape painter and the accomplished miniaturist are incarnate in one and the same individual so rarely are the accomplished novelist and the accomplished short story writer thus incarnate the most fervent admirers of mr rudyard kipling among whom i am proud to count myself will not claim for his novels though possessing the incalculable and indefinable personal touch the magical genius of expression which is to be found in all his work even in the absent-minded beggar the perfection of statement and the flawless technique of plain tales from the hills and life's handicap in the same way we would not measure guy de montpassant's greatness by un vie or mont oriol and though the late henry harland is best known by that study in sunshine the cardinal snuff-box his real lovers turn to the inimitable short stories in grey roses and comedies and errors conversely some of the greatest novelists have but little value as short story writers the so-called short stories of dickens the cricket on the hearth the chimes a christmas carol are between thirty and forty thousand words in length among thackeray's many sketches may be found a few which we understand as short stories but they do not rank with henry esmond and the newcombs the essential novelist accustomed to his broad canvas to the multiplicity of human destinies with which he is concerned and their interrelation to his varied backgrounds to the free space which his art allows him both for minute analysis of character and for his own philosophical reflections on life is apt to find himself absurdly cramped within the narrow confines of the short story his short stories have a way of becoming condensed novels they contain more stuff than they ought to hold at a sacrifice of balance directness and clearness of exposition now without dogmatizing in the conventional fashion or indeed in any fashion over what a short story ought or ought not to be or asserting definite laws of technique i think it is obvious that if a story told in ten thousand words would have been a better clearer more fully developed story told in a hundred thousand it is not a perfectly told story 
for though there is a modern tendency to revolt against an older school of criticism which set technique over subject and to scoff at form yet we cannot get away from the fact that the told story whether long or short is a work of art and is subject to the eternal canons whereby every art is governed no matter what a man has to say if he does not strive to express it perfectly he is offending the condensed novel being imperfect is an offence on the other hand the essential short story writer engaged upon a novel is apt to be dismayed by the vastness of the canvas he has to cover his habit of mind minute delicate and swift wars against a conception of the architectonics of a novel in consequence his novel may appear thin episodical and laboured with scenes spun out beyond their value thus missing their dramatic effect and spoiling the balance of the work if therefore a story of a hundred thousand words could have been told more effectively in ten thousand it is like the condensed novel not a perfectly told story briefly the tendency of the essential novelist in writing a short story is to make literary condensed milk while that of the essential short story writer working in the medium of novel is to make milk and water occasionally of course among the great writers of fiction we meet with the combination of the two faculties balzac the short story writer is as great as balzac the novelist the contes alone would have brought him fame stevenson was master of both crafts who shall say whether the sire de melitroid's door or the ebb tide is the more perfect work of art now among contemporary writers mr leonard merrick is eminently one who like balzac and stevenson is gifted with the double faculty his reputation as a novelist rests on a sure foundation and his novels in this edition of his works will be dealt with by other hands but owing to the fact of the novel being in the commercial world more important than the short story his claim to the distinct reputation of a short story writer has more or less been overlooked again it is popularly supposed that a writer of fiction regards the short story as either a relaxation from more arduous toil or as a means of adding a few extra pounds to his income in his acquiescence in this disastrous superstition lies my quarrel with my distinguished preface writing friend now although i do not say that we are all such high-minded folk that none of us has ever stooped to pot boiling yet i assert that every conscientious artist approaches a short story with the same earnestness as he does a novel further that in proportion to its length he devotes to it more concentration more loving and scrupulous care there are days during the writing of a novel when that combination of fierce desire to work and sense of power which one loosely talks about as inspiration is at ebb and others when it is at flow homer nods sometimes no man can bestow equal essence of himself on every page of a long novel but a short story is generally written at full tide by its nature it can be finished before the impulse is over there is time to weigh every word of it attend to the rhythm of every sentence adjust the delicate balance of the various parts and there is the thrilling consciousness of unity instead of the climax being months off there it is at hand to be reached in a few glad hours so far from being an unconsidered trifle the short story is a work of intense consideration and as far as our poor words can matter of profound importance it may be said that anything in the nature of a plea for the short story as a work of art is hopelessly belated i am quite aware that the wise and gifted made it long ago and i remember the preaching of the apostles of the early nineties but its repetition is none the less useful 
every item in the welter of short stories with which the innumerable magazines both here and in america flood the reading public is not a masterpiece every item is not perfect work many are exceedingly bad bad in conception style and form there is always the danger of the good being hidden of bad and good being confused together in the public mind and of the term magazine story becoming one of contemptuous and unthinking reproach as was the term yellowback a generation ago accordingly it is well that now and again a word should be said in deprecation of an attitude which a tired and fiction-worn world is liable to adopt and it is well to remind it that in the aforesaid welter there are many beautiful works of art and to beseech it to exercise discrimination the writer of an introduction to the work of a literary comrade labours under certain difficulties he ought not to usurp the functions of the critic into whose hands the volume when published will come and he is anxious for the sake of prudence not to use the language of hyperbole though he has it in his heart to do so but at least i can claim for these short stories of mr leonard merrick that each by its perfection of form and the sincerity of its making takes rank as a work of art in none is there a word too little or a word too much everywhere one sees evidence of the pain through which the soul of the artist has passed on its way to the joy of creation everywhere is seen the firmness of outline which only comes by conviction of truth and the light and shade which is only attained by a man who loves his craft the field covered by mr merrick in this collection is one which he has made peculiarly his own mainly it is the world of the artist the poet the journalist in the years when hopes are high and funds are low when the soul is full and the stomach empty it is neither the bohemia of yesterday's romance nor the bohemia of drunken degradation but the sober clean living struggling bohemia of to-day it is a sedate hard-up world of omnibuses lodgings second-rate tea-shops and restaurants yet he does not belong to the static school who set down the mere greyness of their conditions he is a poet making the violet of a legend blow among the chops and steaks as in the lady of lyons to rosie macleod living up ninety-eight stairs of a dingy house in a dilapidated court in montparnasse comes the prince in the fairy tale there is true poetry in the laurels and the lady with its amazing end and yet his method is simple direct romantic he writes of things as they really are but his vision pierces to their significance he can be relentless in his presentation of a poignant situation as in a very good thing for the girl a realist of the realists if you like but here as everywhere in his work are profound pity tenderness and sympathetic knowledge of the human heart he writes not only of things seen but of things felt whatever qualities his work may have it has the great quality essential to all artistic endeavour sincerity william j locke end of section one section two of the man who understood women and other stories this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Fallis. The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories by Leonard Merrick. Section 2. The Man Who Understood Women our bitterest remorse is not for our sins but for our stupidities excerpt from wendover's new novel nothing had delighted wendover so much when his first book appeared as some reviewer's reference to 
the author's knowledge of women he was then six or seven and twenty and the compliment uplifted him the more because he had long regretted violently that he knew even less of women than do most young men the thought of women fascinated him he yearned to captivate them to pass lightly from one love affair to another to have the right to call himself blasé alas a few dances in the small provincial town that he had left when he was eighteen comprised nearly all his sentimental experiences during his years of struggle in london he had been so abominably hard up that lodging-house keepers and barmaids were almost the only women he addressed and as his beverage was a glass of bitter the barmaids had been strictly commercial to be told that he understood women enraptured him instinct he said to himself now and then a man is born who knows the feminine mind intuitively and in his next book there was an abundance of his fanciful psychology denied companionship with women he revelled in writing about them and drew from the pages in which he posed as their delineator something of the exultation that he would have derived from being their lover there were even pages after which he felt sated with conquest at these times nothing accorded with his mood so well as to parade the park and pretend to himself that the sight of the most attractive of the women bored him but as loneliness really cried within him pathetically he had an adventure culminating in marriage with a shop assistant who glanced at him one evening in oxford street after marriage they found as little of an agreeable nature to say to each other as might have been expected so a couple of years later they separated and the ex-shop hand went to reside with a widowed sister who made up ladies own materials at crouch end gradually he came to be accepted at his own valuation to be pronounced one of the few gifted men from whom the feminine soul held no secrets then when he was close on forty a novel that he produced hit the popular taste and he began to make a very respectable income now for the first time he had opportunities for meeting the class of women that he had been writing about and he found to his consternation that they failed to recognize him as an affinity after all they were very amiable but like the farmer with the claret he never got any forwarder he perceived that his profundities were thought tedious and that his attentions were thought raw it was a sickening admission for an authority on women to have to make but when he tried to flirt he felt shy at last he decided that all the women whom he knew were too frivolous to appeal to a man of intellect and that their company wearied him unutterably but though he had reached middle age he had never as yet been really in love in the autumn of his forty-second year few people judged him to be so much he removed to paris some months afterwards in the interest of a novel that he had begun he deserted his hotel in the rue d'antine for a pension de famille on the left bank this establishment which was supported chiefly by english and american girls studying art supplied the colour that he needed for his earlier chapters and it was here that he made the acquaintance of miss cyril miss cyril was about six-and-twenty bohemian and ambitious beyond her talents such penchants de famille abound in girls who are more or less bohemian and ambitious beyond their talents but rhoda cyril was noteworthy her face stirred the imagination she had realized that she would never paint and the free and easy intercourse of the latin quarter had wholly unfitted her for the prim provincialism to which she must return in england my father was a parson she told wendover once as they smoked cigarettes together after dinner 
i had hard work to convince him that english art schools weren't the apex but he gave in at last and let me come here it was paradise my home was in beckenhampton do you know it it's one of the dreariest holes in the kingdom i used to go over to stay with him twice a year i was very fond of my father but i can't tell you how terrible those visits became to me how i had to suppress myself and how the drab women and stupid young men used to stare at me as if i were a strange animal or something improper in places like beckenhampton they say paris in the same kind of voice that they say hell i suppose i'm a bohemian by instinct for even now that i know i should never make an artist my horror isn't so much the loss of my hopes as the loss of my freedom my my identity i am never to be natural any more after i leave here i am to go on suppressing myself till the day i die sometimes i shall be able to shut myself up and howl that's all i've got to look forward to what are you going to do asked wendover looking sympathetic and thinking pleasurably that he had found a good character to put into his book i'm going back she said a shining example of the folly of being discontented with district visiting and church bazaars i go back a failure for beckenhampton to moralize over my old schoolmistress has asked me to stay with her while i look round you see i've spent all my money and i must find a situation if the beckenhampton parents don't regard me as too immoral it is just possible she may employ me in the school to teach drawing unless i try to teach it then i suppose i shall be called a revolutionary and be dismissed she contemplated the shabby little salon thoughtfully and lit another cigarette from the boul miche to a boarding school it'll be a change i wonder if it will be safe to smoke there if i keep my bedroom window open wide yes it would be as great a change as was conceivable and rhoda cyril was the most interesting figure in the house to wendover she was going to england in a month's time there was no reason why she should not go at once save that she had enough money to postpone the evil day and during this valedictory month she and he talked of their friendship in the tortuous streets off the boulevard she introduced him to humble restaurants where the dinners were sometimes amazingly good at ridiculously low prices together they made little excursions and pretended to scribble or sketch in the woods looking at each other however most of the time and then at evening there was an inn to be sought and the moon would rise sooner than the friends and in the moonlight when they returned to paris and the penchant des familles sentiment would constrain their tones it was all quite innocent but to the last degree unwise the ex-shop assistant still throve decorously at crouch end on his allowance and wendover should have seen that he was acting unfairly towards miss searle to do him justice he didn't see it he had confided the story of his marriage to her and it did not enter into his thoughts that she might care for him seriously notwithstanding his experiences had given him no cause to esteem himself dangerous and the lover who has never received favours is in practice always modest though in aspirations he may be one ask the suitor of quick perceptions has been made by other women as everybody but the least sophisticated of debutantes knows but if he did not dream that he might trouble the peace of miss searle he was perpetually conscious that miss searle had disturbed his own a month's daily companionship with a temperament plus a fascinating face would be dangerous to any man to wendover it was fatal his thoughts turned no longer to liaisons with duchesses his work itself was secondary to rhoda searle silly fellow as he appears the emotions wakened in him were no less genuine than if he had combined all the noble qualities with which he invested the heroes of his books 
besides most people would appear silly in a description which dealt only with their weaknesses wendover loved and he cursed the tie that prevented his asking the girl to be his wife how happy he might have been he had feared that the last evening would be a melancholy one but it was gay the greater part of it was gay at any rate as soon as the door slammed behind them he saw that she had resolved to keep the thought of the morrow's journey in the background to help him to turn the farewell into a fete her laughing caution was unnecessary her voice her eyes had given him the cue her journey was to be undertaken in the distant future life was delicious and they were out to enjoy themselves he had proposed dining at armenonville it wasn't the paris that she had known but champagne and fashion seemed the right thing to-night and no fiacre had ever before sped so blithely never had the boy been so enchanting and never had another girl been such joyous company after dinner the ambassadors the programme they didn't listen to much of it they were chattering all the time it was only when the lamps died out that he heard a sigh it was only when the lamps died out that the morning train and the parting and the blank beginning of the afterwards seemed to him so horribly near the little salon was half dark when they reached the pension des familles everybody else had gone to bed wendover turned up the light and though she said it was too late to sit down they stood talking by the mantelpiece you've given me a heavenly memory for the end she told him thanks so much i shall be thinking of it at this time to-morrow so shall i said wendover she took off her hat and pulled her hair right before the mirror shall you will you write to me yes if you'd like me to i'd more than like it i shall look forward to your letters tremendously there won't be much to say in them they'll be from you i wish you weren't going she raised her eyes to him why she asked wendover kept silent a moment it was the hardest thing that he had done in his life if he answered because i love you he felt that he would be a cad besides she must know very well that he loved her what good would it do to tell her so doubtless she had repented her question in the moment of putting it yes he would be a cad to confess to her she would think less of him for it he would choose the bow roll and she would always remember that when he might have spoilt their last scene together and pained her he had been strong heroic we've been such pals he said that she mightn't underrate the heroism he turned aside as the noble fellow in books does when he is struggling after a pause she murmured blankly it's time i said good-night she went to him and gave him her hand her clasp was fervent it was encouraging to feel that she was grateful her gaze held him and her eyes were wide dark troubled he was sure that she was sorry for him "'Good night, my dear,' said Wendover, still as brave as the fellow in the books. And when he had watched her go up the stairs, when she had turned again, with that look in her eyes, and turned away, he went back to the salon, and was wretched beyond words to tell, for a fool may love as deeply as the wisest. This was really their good-bye. In the morning the claims on her were many, and he was not the only one who drove to the station with her. When she had been gone between two and three weeks, he received the promised letter. It told him little but that she was the new drawing-mistress. Of her thoughts, her attitude towards her new life, it said nothing. He replied promptly, questioning her, but she wrote no more, and not the least of his regrets was the thought that she had dismissed him from her mind so easily he did not remain much longer in the boarding-house its associations hurt him too much a sandy-haired girl with no eyelashes and red ears occupied the seat that had been rhoda's at the table and the newcomer's unconcerned possession of it stabbed him at every meal 
having taken precautions against letters for him going astray he returned to the hotel and there month after month he plodded at his book and tried to forget nearly a year had gone by when he stood again on the deck of a channel boat he had not spared himself and the novel was finished and he was satisfied with it but he was as much in love as he had been on the morning when he watched a train steam from the gare st lazare as he paced the deck he thought of rhoda all the time it excited him that he was going to england he might chance to see her he might even run down to beckenhampton for a day or two it would make the situation harder to bear afterwards of course but he looked up beckenhampton in the railway guide often during the next few days the distance between them was marvellously short the knowledge that an hour and a half's journey could yield her face to him again had a touch of the magical in it an hour and a half from hades to olympus the longing fevered him he threw some things into a bag pell-mell one morning and caught the ten fifteen the george hotel and from the hotel he directed the driver to the school the little town was grey and drear he pitied her acutely as he gazed about him from the fly he understood how her spirit must beat itself against the bars he realized what her arrival must have meant to her behind one of the windows of this prison she had sat looking back upon her yesterday how the year must have changed her he wondered if she still smiled the fly jolted into the narrow high street and he saw her coming out of the post office yes she still smiled the smile that irradiated her face and made him forget everything else they stood outside the post office together clasping hands once more you what are you doing here she cried i was just going to see you i've just come from the station how are you you look very well i'm all right are you back for good yes i left paris a few days ago did you stay on at the pension oh no i gave that up soon after you went you've finished your book eh how did you know i saw something about it in a paper and how's paris i dream i'm back sometimes paris is just the same i suppose you never saw anything of the others afterwards kitty owen or the McAllister girl no i never came across any of them i was working very hard well tell me things what's the news you're still at school then no no aren't you i was on my way there what are you doing i'm married the blood sank from his cheeks married i've been married four months a woman came between them to post a letter and he was grateful for the interruption let me congratulate you thanks my husband's a solicitor here you'll come and see us i'm afraid i should have been delighted of course but i have to be in town again this evening we'd better move we're in everybody's way she said will you walk on with me when does the book come out in a few weeks time i'll send a copy to you really it would be very good of you i've often looked at the book columns to see if it was published have you i was afraid you'd forgotten all about me you you might have written again you promised to write i know why didn't you what was the good it would have made me happier i missed you frightfully i i think that was why i left the pension i couldn't stand it when you'd gone well are you happy oh i suppose so i'm glad so you won't come and see us it's impossible i'm sorry to say as a matter of fact i didn't mean to see you again at all that's a pretty compliment ah oh, you know what i mean it seemed better that i shouldn't but i think i'm glad i did i don't know i've wondered sometimes whether you understood we shan't meet any more and i should like you to know don't she exclaimed thickly for heaven's sakes i must 
said wendover i loved you dearly they had walked some yards before she answered her voice was a whisper what's the use of saying that to me now the bitterness of suffering was in the words they flared the truth on him the annihilating truth my god he faltered would it have been any use then her face was colourless she didn't speak rhoda did you care if if i had asked you to stay with me would you have stayed i don't know tell me yes then i would have stayed she said hoarsely whom should i have hurt i was alone i had no one to study but myself i wanted you to ask me stayed i'd have thanked god if you had spoken you were blind you wouldn't see and now when it's too late you come and say it i wanted to be straight to you he groaned i sacrificed my happiness to be straight to you it was damnably hard to do i know but i didn't want sacrifices i wanted love oh it's no good our talking about it she stopped and sighed we shall both get over it i suppose is it too late pleaded wendover brokenly quite things aren't the same last year i was free to do as i liked i have no conventions but i have a conscience there's my husband to consider now and and more too i shouldn't be contented like that to-day i should have injured others you and i let our chance slide and we shall never get it back smile and say something about nothing there are people who know me coming along and he did not sleep at the george after all in the next train that left for euston a grey-faced man sat with wide eyes cursing his own obtuseness and he has not met her since there is of course a brighter side to the history although rhoda is unhappy she is happier than she would have remained with wendover when the guilt was off the gingerbread and though wendover will never forget her he cherishes her memory with more tenderness than he would have continued to cherish the girl but neither she nor he recognizes this and in wendover's latest work one may see the line that has been quoted our bitterest remorse is not for our sins but for our stupidities the reception of the novel was most flattering and as usual the author's insight into the mind of woman has been pronounced remarkable end of section two section three of the man who understood women and other stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by peter s fay new york peter s fay dot deviant art dot com the man who understood women and other stories by leonard merrick chapter two a very good thing for the girl Bagot told us this tale in the stage door club one night. We were sitting round the fire talking of perfect love, and somebody asked him if he had ever thought of marrying. Once, said the comedian cheerfully, couldn't you afford it? His talent and the remains of his good looks were worth fifty pounds a week to him then, but there had been days, well, listen to Bagot. It wasn't that I couldn't afford it, he said with a laugh. Actors never wait till they can afford it. I escaped in a curious way. What saved me was being such an artist. Fact. I was really smitten. If I hadn't been an artist in spite of myself, 
I should be shivering in the last train home to Bedford Park now, instead of talking to you, dear boys, in an armchair with a glass at my side. What? Oh, I'll tell you about it with pleasure. Of course you know I made my name as the Reverend Simon Tibbets in poor Pulteney's Touch and Go. Some things a man doesn't forget, and I remember how I felt when I settled for the part better than I remember yesterday. You see, it was my first London engagement, and I had been trying to get one in London for sixteen years. Sixteen years I had been on the road, and seen the amateurs with money sauntering onto the West End stage from their varsity club. My agent had told me to try my luck at the office over the theatre one morning in July, and when I went in, there was nobody there but a young man who I guessed must be Pulteney. He was sitting at the table with a pencil in his hand, fiddling with a model of one of the scenes, and looking as worried as if he had been Chancellor of the Exchequer. "'Have I the honor of speaking to Mr. Pulteney?' said I. In those days, I imagined authors were important persons. He flushed and smiled, rather on the wrong side of his mouth, I thought. That's my name. I was sent round to see you about the part of the clergyman in your farcical comedy, Mr. Pulteney, I said. I had really been sent to see the stage manager, but soft soap is never wasted, and I was always a bit of a diplomatist. He asked me to sit down, and we talked. He was smoking a cigarette, and I thought for a moment he was going to offer me one. I suppose it occurred to him that it wouldn't be the right thing to ask an actor to smoke in the manager's room, for he threw his own cigarette away. He was a gentleman, poor Pulteney, though he was a deuced bad dramatist. The manager came bustling back soon and began to hum and haw, but Pulteney put in a word that made it all right. I was told it was a capital part, and a big chance for me, and I skipped downstairs and out into the street, feeling as puffed up as if I owned the Strand. As a matter of fact, the salary wasn't much. I had better money in the provinces, but the thought of making a hit in the West End so excited me that I was nearly popping with pride. Great Cumberland Place! Wasn't I sold when the part came? You've no idea how duffing it really was. I don't mind saying that a good many jolly fine comedians would never have got a laugh in it. When I read the jokes, I could have cried. It wasn't as funny as the author wrote it, dear boys, believe me. I don't want to brag of what I've done. I'm not the man to gas about myself, but it was the character I put into it that made Pulteney's peace. Well, the rehearsals weren't beginning for three weeks, and I kept hoping I'd see how to do something with it before the first call. I spoke the lines one way, and I spoke the lines another way, and the more I studied, the glummer I felt. I had my dinner at Exeter Hall several times and listened to the people giving their orders. It was cheap, and I thought I might hear the sort of tone I was trying to get hold of, but I didn't. On the Sunday, I went to three churches and sat through three sermons. Honest Injun! And that was no use. Talk about an RA's difficulty in finding the right model. I spent eight dusty days scouring London for a model for the Reverend Simon Tibbets. Then one afternoon, I had come out of Prosser's Avenue. As it happened, I wasn't thinking shop. I wasn't thinking about anything in particular. And all of a sudden, I heard a voice. A voice? I heard the voice. I heard the voice I needed for the part. I jumped. My heart was in my throat. 
There, smiling up at a six-foot constable, was a little parson asking the way to Baker Street. He looked like an elderly cherub with his pink cheeks and his innocent inquiring eyes. I held my breath in the hope he would go on talking, but the policeman had answered him, and he tripped along with merely a thank you. He tripped along with the oddest walk I have ever seen, and I dodged after him, never taking my gaze off his legs and studying them all the way to Charing Cross. As I expected, he was going by bus. There was one just moving. Up went his umbrella, and the next moment I was on the step too, intending to lure him into conversation as soon as I could, and master his voice as nicely as I was mastering his legs. Full inside, said the conductor, putting his dirty hand before my face. I was so annoyed I could have punched his head. Well, there was nothing for it but to go on top and wait for someone to get out. Hang it, nobody did get out, and I saw no more of my little model till we reached Baker Street. I meant to let him walk a few yards, and then ask him to direct me to Lord's, but there was a surprise for me. He tripped across the road into the station. Oh-ho, I said to myself, training it? So much the better. We're going to have a comfortable chat together, after all, you and I. I kept as close to him when he took his ticket as if I'd designs on his watch, and I heard him say, Third class to Rickmansworth, if you please. This was rather awkward. I didn't want to pay a long fare, and I didn't know the line well. I had to book as far as Rickmansworth, too. When we got round to the platform, the train was there, and he hovered up and down for five minutes or more, looking for a seat to suit him. I began to think we'd both be left behind. Then, just as they were slamming the doors, he made up his mind. In he went, and I after him. And, what do you think? We were both on the same side of the compartment with a fat woman and a soldier between us. Two passengers between us, I give you my word, and no room opposite. Not only I couldn't talk to him, I couldn't even see him. Every time we drew into a station, I prayed the compartment would thin a bit. I sat tense, watching the faces. Not a sign on them. You've heard of the American rustic who got so exasperating standing up in a crowded car that at last he shouted, Say, ain't none of your people got homes? That's how I felt. Bagot's imitation of the rustic was very good, and we signified our appreciation in the usual way. When the laugh was over, someone told the waiter we were thirsty, and the storyteller filled his pipe. Well, he resumed, puffing, to cut a long journey short, we reached Rickmansworth without my having had a glimpse of my gentleman. I was about desperate now. He hadn't taken a dozen steps when I overtook him and asked if he would be kind enough to inform me whether any decent apartments were to be had in the village. It didn't seem worthwhile to have had all this bother just to hear him speak again for ten seconds, and I was wishing myself back in my apartments in Kennington. I said the first thing that came into my head. It turned out to be the best question I could have put. I am a visitor myself, he said, beaming at me. But I believe there are rooms to be had in Cornstalk Terrace. Yes, I am almost positive I noticed a card in the window as I passed through the street this morning. I stood simply lapping his voice up. Is it difficult for a stranger to find? I asked. No, indeed, he said. It is quite near. But I am going there if you care to accompany me. Oh, you're too good, I exclaimed, and upon my word, I could have hugged him. 
The road was a great deal nearer than I wanted it to be, for he was chirruping to me beautifully, and I hated to part from him. When we arrived, I effervesced with gratitude, and he hoped I'd find comfortable quarters, and then I would went straight back to the station, and heard that I had just missed a train. Pleasant? Rickmansworth isn't the sprightliest place I've ever waited in either. I had some nourishment in the bar of the hotel across the way, and I examined the high street. It wasn't extensive. The barmaid had told me there was a park close by, so I started to discover it. I wasn't keen on the park, you understand, but I thought it would be a nice quiet spot to rehearse in and see if I had caught the little clerk's voice. As I was going along past a row of villas, blessed if I didn't come across him again, standing at his gate. He supposed I had been hunting for lodgings all the time, so, of course, I had to keep the game up. He was a friendly old chap, and, honor bright, I felt sorry to think I was going to turn him into ridicule on the stage. Still, he would never know, and actors can't be choosers. He went inside to ask his landlady if she could recommend any diggings to me, and a minute afterwards out he fluttered to say he had quite forgotten there would be a couple of rooms vacant in that very house next day. Christopher Columbus! I had had no more idea of taking rooms than I had of taking the Theatre Royal, Drury Lane. But it was too gigantic a chance to miss. I fixed the matter with the old woman there and then, and the next morning my model and I were living under the same roof. Pass the matches, one of you fellows, my pipe's out. At the back of the house there were some lettuces and a clothes prop that were called a garden. My parlor was at the back too, and after dinner I saw the rector airing himself. By now I had learnt he was a rector. I lost no time in joining him, you may be sure. I wasn't paying two rents to go to sleep on the sofa, and we discussed politics and public libraries. It was a bit heavy for me, but I didn't worry much what he talked about, so long as I could hear his dulcet tones. I ought to have said there was a bench against the clothes prop, so far as her means permitted the old woman did things handsomely. There was a bench, and we sat down on it, and while we were sitting there the door opened, and out into the sunshine there came a young and beautiful girl. She wore a white cotton frock, and there was no paint or powder on her face, and she had the kind of eyes that made you want to say your prayers and be good. I'm not going to gush, I'm holding myself in, but on my honor, she was just the saintliest picture of English maidenhood ever seen in a poet's dream. My daughter, said my model. I was so staggered that I bowed like a super at a bob a night. Yes, the old woman did things handsomely. There was room for three on the bench. She sat by me, turning a backyard into a paradise. I meant the girl, not the old woman, and I forgot to study her father for a half an hour. I heard where his living was and why they were taking a holiday, and I stammered that I was an actor and was afraid they'd be shocked. I was stupid to own it, though it was all right, and they didn't mind. But there was something in that girl's eyes that forced the truth from you in spite of yourself. I had been going to say I was in the city, but the lie stuck. There is some fine country round Rickmansworth, Ricky as the natives call it, and we used to explore the three of us. We'd go to Chorley Wood and to Chenny's. What a good back cloth Chenny's would make. By the end of the week, we were together nearly all the day. They invited me into their room to supper, and after supper, Marion would sing at a decrepit piano. The meals were quite plain, you know. Sometimes we'd pick the green stuff in the garden ourselves, but boys, 
the peace of that little village room in the lamplight, the minister and his child, the simple God-fearing man, and that girl with her deep grave eyes and earnest voice, their devotion to each other, the homeliness of it all. To me, a touring player, it was sweet, it was wonderful, to be welcomed in an atmosphere of home. If the comedy had been put into rehearsal on the date arranged, it would have been better for me, but it wasn't. The rehearsals were postponed, and soon I was thinking much more of Marion than of my part. I used to talk to her of, well, things I had never talked of to anyone except my mother when I was a kid. Somehow, I didn't feel ashamed to talk of them to that girl. She took me out of myself. She raised me up. The footlights were forgotten. Oh, I had no right to think of her in the way I did, of course. What could I hope for? There was a world between us, and I saw it. I told myself that I had done all I came to do, and that I ought to go back to town at once. I told myself I was mad to stay there. But I knew I loved her. I loved her as I have never loved a woman since. And there were moments when I thought that she was fond of me. But go, it was rapidly becoming evident to us, had forgotten that he had prefaced the story by congratulating himself on not having married the girl. His voice trembled. We saw that, carried away by his own intensity as a narrator, he was beginning to believe he was a blighted being. But we looked sympathetic and let him work it up. One day she owned she cared for me, he continued with a faraway air. It was the day before they were going home, and we were talking of our friendship. Somehow I, I lost my head, and she was crying in my arms. I asked her to marry me. I swore she would never repent it. She sat listening to me with her hands limp in her lap and a look on her face that I shall see till I die. She was afraid, not of me, but that her father wouldn't consent. They had no violent prejudice against the theater, but she had never been to one in her life. For her to marry an actor seemed an impossible thing. I went to him right off. I told him I worshipped her. I implored him to trust her to me. It was an awful shock to him. I don't believe he had a suspicion of the state of affairs. He reproached himself for letting it come about. But he was very gentle. He said he had hoped for a far different future for her. Still, that all he wanted was for his child to be happy. He said he couldn't stand in her way if he knew she was really sure of herself. In the end, he promised she should marry me, if she wanted to, in three years' time. When I parted from her, we considered we were engaged, and in the event, after they left, I went to town. I went to town, and there was a call for the first rehearsal of Touch and Go. I had forgotten business. I had forgotten everything but Marion. That call paralyzed me. I saw what I had done. I'd realized the situation. The girl I was to marry reverenced her father, and I meant to burlesque him on the stage. I couldn't do it. I wouldn't. How could I think of it now? It wasn't that I feared their finding it out, as I tell you, they weren't playgoers, and their home was a good way off. Besides, it was the heartlessness of the thing that frightened me. To make myself up as her father? To speak the bland, hypocritical lines of the part in her father's voice? To mimic him? To turn him into ridicule to amuse a crowd? I say, how could I do it? All the same, it was precious difficult to avoid, for I had studied him so long. But I went to the show box for the first day and rehearsed as I had expected to rehearse before I met him. Perhaps not so well. It was a strain not to be like him, after all my study, and it made me pretty run. I rehearsed so the first day, and for three or four days, 
and presently I began to notice that the management was a bit unhappy, and that Pulteney nearly twisted his moustache out during my scenes. If an author has written a bad part, trust him to blame the actor. He buttonholed me at last and begged me to put a little more character into it, and I tried to, but I knew it was a failure, for I could only see one character all the time, and that one I wouldn't touch. When I was in the stalls once, he and the manager sat down and put their heads together. It was dark in front, and they hadn't seen me as they came around. I heard them say something about a pity they hadn't a West End actor for the part. I knew they were talking of my part, and it got my dander up. I knew I could act any of that West End hoity-toity company off the stage. I knew I had only to let myself go. When I went on again, I determined I'd show them what I could do. I determined I'd show them that they had a better comedian than any 40 pound a weaker. I sent them into fits. Hello, they said. The women in the wings stopped talking about their dresses to watch me. The highly connected amateurs from Oxford and Cambridge began to give at the knees, and I could hear the leading man's heart drop to the boards. The actor from the provinces was wiping them out. That rehearsal was the sweetest triumph of my life. She'd never know. She'd never know, I kept telling myself. She couldn't hear of it. By the time the wig that I ordered was tried on, I felt as sure of success as I was of my lines. I was soaked in the part. I wasn't acting the little rector. By George, I was the little rector. Trip, face, and chirrup. And the first night came, and I was to play in London at last. They told me the house was crammed. All the swell critics were there. All the fashionable first-nighters. I was so nervous that the wig paste shook in my hands when I made up, but I was ready much too soon. I went downstairs and waited. The doorkeeper gave me a note. Of all the... It was from Marion. A friend had brought her up to see me, and she was in the theater. I was stunned. I thought I was going to fall. You know, every man in this room knows that for an actor to remodel his performance at the last minute would be a miracle. I couldn't do it. It wasn't in my power. But even then I thought I'd try. I said I must try, though it would ruin me. And I heard my cue. My first lines went for nothing. I floundered. The audience were ice. I saw the people on the stage looking at me aghast. Then suddenly I got a laugh. A gesture, an invitation. Something I had been trying to hold back had escaped me. The laugh went to my head. I made them laugh again. I said I'd explain to Marion that she'd understand that she'd forgive me, and even while I said it, my other self, the self that wasn't acting, knew it was a lie, and I was losing her. I couldn't help it. The laughter made me drunk. I did it all. I knew the disgust she must be feeling, but the audience were roaring at me now. I felt the shame that she was suffering with my own heart, but the artist in me swept on. The manager panted at me in the wings. You're great! You're immense! Gad, you're making the hit of the piece! The stalls were in convulsions. The gallery had got my name. Bago! They were shouting after each act. Bago! Pulteney rushed to me with blessings at the end. The house thundered for me. It was London. I knew that I was made. But across the flare of grinning faces... I seemed to see the angel I had lost, and the horror in her eyes. Bago bowed his head. His pipe had fallen. Tears dripped down his cheeks. By the time he was quite sure he had been mourning for her ever since beside a lonely hearth. She wrote to me next day, breaking it off, he groaned. She wouldn't listen to reason. She said it might be art, but it wasn't love. Did you ever see her afterwards? we asked. Once, he said, years later. 
She married some county chap with an estate and all that. I saw her driving with her little boy. She looked very happy, I thought. Women soon forget. After a pause, he added bitterly. If one of you fellows, he glanced at the only author in the group, cares to write the true tragedy of a man's life, there it is. You might call it the price of success. But we all thought a more appropriate title would be the one that I have used. End of section three. Recording by Peter S. Fay, New York, Peter S. Fay dot DeviantArt dot com. Section four of the man who understood women and other stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Carol Elaine, Pasadena, California. The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories by Leonard Merrick. The Woman Who Wished to Die. My meeting with Mr. Peters was so momentous that I can't resist mentioning it was due to someone I had never seen, to a trifle. I can't resist referring to my own affairs for a moment. I was supposed to be at work on a novel, and I had a mind as fertile as mashed potato. One day in August I tumbled a receipt out of a desk, and saw that the lady to whom I had sent my stories to be typewritten had had nothing from me to typewrite for two months. The discovery dismayed me. I was ashamed to realize how slowly I was getting on, and resolved to try a change of surroundings. My trip altered the course of lives, and I shouldn't have made it but for the reproach of a stranger's receipt. I decided upon Ostend by way of Antwerp, where I wanted to see the pictures. Also I meant to visit Brussels, where I wanted to see my prettiest cousin. And in Antwerp, behold, Mr. Peters! As I was wandering through the gallery, an American asked me if I could tell him in which of the rooms he could find the last communion of St. Francis of Assisi. Having just been directed to it myself, just been startled by the faultless fluency of an official's English, I had the information pat, and the American and I proceeded to the room together. I remember feeling it incumbent on me to be pained by the first words he spoke in front of the picture. I am told, he remarked, that Rubens sold this work for sixty pounds, English money, and that forty thousand pounds were subsequently paid for it. <laughs> Rough on Rubens! I affected the tone of the superior person. You would see it better if you stood further away, I said. What do you think of the painting? Oh, the painting, he answered. I am no judge, but the way the value of that property has risen just astonishes me. I did not think I should like him but I began to like him surprisingly soon. He was a sad-faced middle-aged man with a simple manner that was wonderfully winning. In less than five minutes I was humiliated that I have sneered at him in front of St. Francis of Assisi. By what right, how much did I understand of it myself? My attitude had been nine-tenths pose. This man was genuine. He spoke of what he found interesting, and he proved anything but a fool. We went down the steps of the Musée des Beaux side by side, and strolled through the hot streets, among the swarm of ragged Flemish children. <laughs> there are more ragged children to the square yard in Antwerp than in Westburn Park, to the quarter of the hotels. It turned out that we were staying at the same one, he on the first floor and I on the fifth, and after dinner we drifted together to the place Vert and talked there under the trees while the band played. He told me that he had not been to Europe before, and I discerned that he was a lonely man persevering with the effort to enjoy himself. The fact is, he said, handing me his cigar case, I ought to have made the trip some years ago. Won't you try a cigar, sir? There's nothing the matter with Europe, but I guess I'm not quite so keen on sightseeing as I was. When I was a lad I was dead struck on coming over, but I hadn't the dollars then. I promised myself to have a good time when I was thirty, and I hustled. When I was thirty, I had made a few dollars, but I saw no chance of the good time. I was still hustling. One afternoon it occurred to me that I was forty. It displeased me some. 
it seemed to me that good time was never coming at the start i had aimed to be the boss of a business but now the business had got so big it was bossing me well i said you have made your pile and you have nobody to spend it on but yourself next year you shall quit and have that good time you have been working for so long but it didn't come off the business went on swelling and i went on saying next year and before i knew where i was i was fifty and his voice dropped a little and i have never had the good time yet he was leaving for austin the next morning and when we parted i was sorry he wasn't to remain in antwerp till the end of the week like myself however at austin i expected we should meet again for i did not mean to stay long in brussels it is a beautiful city and many of us would admire it much more if it did not set us yearning for paris the resemblance is striking but the fascination is absent to go to brussels is like calling on the sister of the woman one is in love with brussels is paris provincialized one realizes it before one has sat outside a cafe for an hour and watched the types go by literally it is provincialized in august when most of the theatres are closed and the streets are peopled by excursionists i had intended to stay three or four days at most but duty to my relatives kept me with them for ten or twelve and at last when i did reach ostend i had almost forgotten mr peters the thought of him recurred to me as i made my way towards the casal on the first evening and i wondered if he was still here it was eight o'clock and now that the glare of sun upon the blister de gay had faded and the radiance of electricity had risen in its stead the town was looking its best ostend was still dining the long continuous line of hotel windows fronting the sea was brilliant window after window wide curtainless and open to the view a frontage of gleaming tables and coloured candle shades a dazzling frontage of flowers and faces and women's jewelled necks and arms in the casal the orchestra was playing l'amico fritz i had listened to the music for perhaps half an hour when i saw mr peters he was with a friend and he passed without observing me they sat down a short distance off and i noticed that he was talking with much animation to her with much more animation than he had shown with me indeed i think that was what i noticed first of all the unexpected animation of mr peters but the next instant i was engrossed by his companion she was not youthful i didn't consider her pretty her dress rich as it was appeared to me a dowdy sort of thing among the elaborate toilettes around us then what engrossed me well it was the expression that she wore i am trying to find the word pleasure of course but that says nothing as nearly as i can explain it was the wonder in her look the wonder that is it there were crow's feet about her eyes and her gaze shone with a young girl's wonder eventually the interest in the conversation was mutual and i assumed that they had known each other in the states then a second time they passed me and i heard her speak and she had no trace of the american accent it began to seem to me that mr peters had been losing no time at austin i saw him with her again on the morrow and on the next day but two or three days went by before i saw him alone when we did have a chat i couldn't withstand the temptation to allude to her you're in better spirits i said have you come across any one from the other side to cheer you up a suspicion of a smile flickered across his thin shrewd lips no he drawled no i have met no acquaintances in europe yet but he handed his cigar case to me won't you try a cigar sir but i am getting along i used to wish he would present me to her but he never did constantly those two figures sat together in the casal in the concert room or on the terrace if i found the little woman i found mr peters never to my knowledge did she speak to anybody else and always the girlishness of her gaze held and mystified me always that is to say until the end was approaching of course i didn't know that it threatened the end then but i couldn't fail to perceive the difference the curiosity she had inspired in me was so strong i had watched her so intently for nearly a fortnight oh it may sound vulgar i don't defend myself that was the first time i glanced across her face and saw trouble there i was sensible of a distinct shock and in the next few days i said it was heavy trouble 
it was as if the blaze within her were dwindling as if it were dying out and leaving her cold and grey i said it is a great word but once i said the look on her face was terror i did not attach any importance to the fact that mr peters was sitting alone on the terrace when i went to the casal one evening because i supposed that he was waiting there for her to come in it was when i found him alone in the same place much later that i was surprised you know how you understand sometimes without a gesture that a man wants you to sit down by him but doesn't want you to speak i knew that mr peters wanted me to sit down by him and didn't want me to speak i think we must have sat looking at the track of moonlight on the sea for a quarter of an hour before either of us said a word then he remarked dryly my friend is gone you must miss her i responded he mused again and added his cigar case to me with his usual question i said i would have a cigarette you have found me dumbfounded he resumed puffing his cigar deliberately by the most singular occurrence i have heard of in my life i am beginning to get my breath back you may have noticed the lady i said that i had i guess that you assume her to be a wealthy woman i said that i did well sir she is about as poor as they make them i have lived too long to be extravagant with emotions but that little lady's history has just broken me up as a writer you may find it worth your attention it was because she had always been solitary that was what started the trouble her loneliness it's an awful thing to conjecture how many poor little women in london are breaking their hearts with loneliness never a companion she had never a pleasure morning she walked to her employment evening she worked back to where she lodged she was a girl of eighteen then and she walked cheerfully and she was cheerful when she was twenty and twenty-five and thirty always keeping her pluck up with the thought of something brighter ahead you know always hoping like me for that good time go on i said when she had been clerking years and doing homework in her leisure she had put a small sum by but she was frightened to touch it there was the growing fear of the lonely woman that one day she might take sick and need that money and the good time didn't come and her youth went out of her and lines began to creep about her eyes and mouth she looked in the glass and saw them and she didn't walk to and from quite so bravely now twenty years odd she had had of drudgery and the hopefulness was dying in her she was just faint with longing sir she wanted to put on pretty things before she was old she was starving for a taste of the sweets that she was meant for he blew a circlet of smoke into the air and watched it that stage passed seemed to the woman as time dragged on that she hadn't the energy left to long for anything she was tired when she lay down to sleep she wasn't particularly keen on waking up any more as i see the matter it was by no means the work that had done the damage it was the dullness it was the emptiness of her life the forlornness of it by and by she had to go to a doctor and he talked about depression and melancholia he said what she ought to do was live with friends she was about as friendless as robinson crusoe before friday turned up he recommended her to seek gay society she said she was much obliged and went back to her lodging and sat staring from the window at the strangers passing in the twilight i don't know whether you have struck a case of melancholia a man i was fond of was taken that way in buffalo out of business he would sit brooding by the hour with his eyes wide and never saying a word i stayed talking to him once half the night persuading him to put a change of linen in his grip and start for europe in the morning i told him it would do him good to hustle round the stores buying most things he needed to put on after he arrived i guess my arguments weren't so excellent as my intentions when i went downtown after breakfast i heard he had shot himself melancholy is likely to be serious no the doctor's advice wasn't much use to the little woman her walk to the office lay across some bridge one evening as she was crossing it the thought came that it would be sweet if she were lying in the river and heard the water singing in her ears then she tore herself away because she had turned giddy every morning and evening she had to cross that bridge you understand me every morning and evening that thought pulled at her and she stopped by the parapet and looked down in the pause he made the music from the concert room was painfully distinct 
they were playing invitation to the boss. Well, just as with the friend I lost in Buffalo, he went on quietly. While she did her work like a machine all day, she was proposing to die. She had grown so woeful tired that it was a relief to her to think of dying. You will smile at what I'm going to say. One afternoon she saw an ordinary picture advertisement stuck on a wall, a picture of a continental resort with fashionable ladies parading on the digay. She told me that, with the thought of death great in her mind, she stood right there in the London street, looking at it. And, sir, her regret was that she was going out of the world without once having worn a pretty frock or bought a handful of roses in December. You may laugh at the idea of a commonplace poster influencing a woman at such a time. I'm not laughing, I said. She harped on that grievance of hers till some of the interests of her girlhood stirred in her again. The enthusiasm had gone, but she was wistful, and she'd sit thinking. She'd sit looking at her savings book, all she had to show for her life. She figured out that she might break away from her employment and have luxury for a month. When the month was up, she'd be destitute. That didn't matter, because, you see, she was quite prepared to go to sleep in the Thames. That little drudge and that stuffy little lodging took a notion to escape for once into the sunshine. She asked herself why she shouldn't live for a month before she died. She was timid when she went to buy the showy frocks. She touched the daintiest of them lovingly, but she was too shy to choose them for herself. She had felt that she had entered the store too late to wear the thing she had hankered for so long. She came here the day after I arrived. She appeared a sad little body, sitting next to me at table. Perhaps that was why I took to her so. But now it just amazes me to think of the way she livened up when we had grown friends. I have heard her laugh, sir. I have heard her laugh quite happily, though her cash was melting like an ice cream in an oven, though she had come to tremble each time she changed a gold piece, though she had come to shudder at each sunset that brought her nearer to the end. It was only this afternoon that she told me the circumstances. I had seen she had anxiety, and I asked questions. I looked to meet her again this evening, but I got a letter instead to say I should never meet her any more. When they handed me her letter, she had gone. You don't mean she's... She's dead, I whispered. Not yet, he said. She wrote that our friendship had helped her some. She wrote that she was going back to her old lodging and would struggle on. But she resigned her position, and she has changed her last banknote. How long do you surmise that she will have the heart to struggle? He lit another cigar, and among the jeweled exotic crowd, we stared absently over the rail at the humble flock of weary trippers who lacked the shillings to come in. One may do worse than cross to Ostend merely to stand by that slender rail and watch the two worlds that it divides. At last I said, She must have liked you very much. Her feelings for you made her want to live. And then, to remain here with you, she squandered the money that she needed to keep her alive. It makes me feel good to hear you say so, he returned. It is not encouraging that she has disappeared, knowing that she had never mentioned even the quarter where she lodged. But it would be the proudest moment of my life if that little lady would consent to marry me. When we get up, we shall say good-bye. I am starting for London right away. Without a clue to her address? Yes, sir, without a notion. I don't know where she lodged, and I don't know where she worked, and London's a mighty big city. But I estimate there are about two sovereigns between that woman and the river, and I have to find her before they're gone. In his glance I saw the grit that had built his fortune. I tried to be hopeful. If she's hunting for a situation, she'll look at the newspapers, I said. She will look at the columns that interest her, he answered, but I mayn't advertise on every page. You can pay for inquiries. You may bet I'll pay. All that worries me is that inquiries go slow. I suppose you don't know which bridge it is she crosses every day. We can build no hopes on the bridge, he replied. I did not interrogate her. I did not suspect it was to be our last meeting. She may struggle longer than you think. She may be brave. You mean it kindly, he said. But you have heard her history. I opine that I have got to discover that address within a week. I am racing against time. 
There's just this in my favor. She has a name to be noticed. She's called Joanna Fayed, and I guess there can't be many women called that, even in a city the size of London. What an extraordinary thing, I faltered. I can give you Joanna Fayed's address on half a hundred receipts. Why, she must be the lady who typewrites my stories for me! End of section four. Recording by Carolee Lane, Pasadena, California. This has been a LibriVox recording. Section five of The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by S.K. Edison, New Jersey. The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories by Leonard Merrick. Frankenstein II. I was at the Throne Theatre to see Orlando Lightfoot's comedy. Entering the buffet, in the first interval I met Orlando Lightfoot. Hello, old man, I said. Congratulations in large quantities. Thanks, said the new dramatist. Have you seen it before? No, but I saw in the papers that it was an emphatic success. How beautiful Elsie Millar is in the part. We induced one of the personages behind the bar to notice that we were present, and removed our glasses to a table. Orlando sighed heavily. What's the trouble? I inquired. My emphatic success, he said. But it's too long a tale to tell you, Nov. I suppose you want to see the second act? The vindictiveness with which he pronounced the last two words was startling. I stared at him. My dear Orlando, I began, but he cut me short. Call me Frankenstein, he groaned. Like Frankenstein, I've constructed a monster that's destroying me. Before I created this accursed comedy, I was a happy man. It must have been a very long while before, I said. When I had the misfortune to share your rooms, you used to remark casually at breakfast that you wished you were dead. Anyone is liable to express dissatisfaction in moments, but on the whole I was cheerful and buoyant, especially when you were out, he insisted. I frequently had as much as five pounds at the time. I'm not boasting. You know it's true. Five pounds at the time is prosperity, if a fellow hasn't got a monster to support. Since I wrote the comedy, a five-pound note has been as ephemeral as a postage stamp. I pinched and pawned to start the monster in life. What it cost me in typewriting alone would have kept me for a month. It has gorged gold. It has devoured my all. And now, by a culminating stroke of diabolical malice, it's breaking my heart. There's nearly a quarter of an hour before the act, I said. Give me a cigarette and a story. I want one badly. An appreciative editor is eager to send a check. Halves? asked the author of the emphatic success. Halves, I agreed. Well, said Orlando, the devil tempted me in the pit of the Wardwell one night. Elsie Millar was in the cast. She had very little to do, but as usual she did it exquisitely. I had always admired her, wished I knew her, and that night I thought, by Jove, wouldn't I like to write a big part for her? Wouldn't she make a hit if she only got the chance? I came out after the performance, imagining her in the sort of part she's playing in the monster. The plot was beginning to put its head round the corner, and I wandered out of the strand onto the embankment, trying to get hold of it. The embankment was deserted, and the river... Yes, I said, cut that kind of thing. I can put it in when I do the writing. I don't want to miss any of the second act. Well... I went to bed about three o'clock with a plot that enraptured me. When I woke up and saw it in the daylight, it wouldn't look quite so fetching, as is the way of plots, etc. Still, it had good features, if it wasn't a Venus, and I curled its hair and titivated it generally till it was fascinating again. The dialogue was the most interesting work, especially the love scene. I enjoyed that. It was like making love to a nice girl myself and saying the right things at the time instead of thinking of them afterwards. I ought to have been turning out stuff for the papers, but I let them slide, and at last the play was finished. It sounds as rapid as filling your pipe, told like this. When you do the story, you should stress the alternate ups and downs of the business, the nights when I wrote epigrams and felt like Pinero, and the mornings when I read them and felt like cutting my throat. 
Don't forget that. It's real. I'll remember, I said. I'll have a paragraph on it. Well, I had two copies of the thing, typewritten at Miss Beck's in Rupert Street. And pretty they were, tied up with pink bows, till I put in all the improvements I had thought of after I posted to her. The improvements I had thought of after I posted to her made such a mess of the copies that I had to have two more typewritten. However, I couldn't pretend she was dear, and I paid and looked pleasant. Guilelessly, I imagined my expenses were over. Sonny, they were just beginning. Miss Beck's bill was only the preface. A man who knew the ropes told me I should be a fool to have the script hawked about before it had been copyrighted. How do you do it? I said. Oh, he said, it's very easy. You give a private performance of the piece in a building licensed for public entertainments. There are a few details to be observed. When I grasped the details, I knew I had committed a reckless extravagance in writing a play. I examined my belongings and doubted if they would run to luxuries like this. Still, I had constructed the monster, and it had its claims. I did my duty by it. I hired a hall in Waltham store for an afternoon. I invented two columns of fashions for men to pay for the hall in Waltham store. Whipping a tired brain, I invented them, and then they fetched eighteen pence short of the rent. I posted one of the nice clean copies of the monster to the Lord Chamberlain to read. I didn't want him to read it, especially since I had learned the compliment was to cost me guineas, but that was one of the details to be observed. I had to pawn my watch for the Lord Chamberlain, and he didn't even send the nice clean copy back. He buried it in archives. More typewriting expenses. After that, I had to have the parts typewritten. My dress clothes paid for the parts. Then I had to advertise for artists to read them. I got my artists cheap, a half crown a head, but my watch chain went after my watch, and the monster began to attack my library. Any more details? I asked. One or two, said the man. You must have a couple of playbills printed, and don't forget to register your title. Well, I won't bell on the drinks, but by the time I was through with the Waltham Store Hall and Stationer's Hall, the monster had left nothing in my wardrobe except a Macintosh, and had consumed a complete set of Thackeray bound in calf. Orlando groaned again, and I murmured sympathy. I also reminded him that the second act must be drawing near. All right, he said testily. Listen, the monster was now my legal property. It was about the only property I did have now. But anyhow, the monster was mine. I was informed that an official license for it would reach me in due course. It might be my next move. An average intellect might have been shattered by the sacrifices I had made for the beast. I was still brilliant. Did I send the thing to a theatre uninvited and wait six months to see it expelled? Not Orlando. I realised that I was an outsider. I realised that I needed someone to take me in. Elsie Millar was playing at the St. James then. She had never heard of me, but I wrote to her. I said I had written a comedy with her in my mind, and that I'd like her to read it before I offered it to a management. What for? What for? Because I thought she might be so enamoured of a part that she'd move mountains to get the piece produced. My prolix friend, I said, I perfectly understand your inward reason, but what was the reason you gave to the lady? Oh, said Orlando, I borrowed from a letter that I once knew an actress receive from a full-blown dramatist. I wrote that I was, quote, desirous of hearing whether she would care to play the part if an opportunity arose, end quote. Suggestive? For an amateur who had never been through a stage door, it was consummate impudence, I admitted. And she replied? She replied that she would be pleased to read the piece if I sent it to her private address. It departed to her, registered the same day, and I wish you wouldn't keep interrupting me. Well, a fortnight went by, a fortnight of suspense that I can't describe to you. I don't want you to describe it, I exclaimed. For heaven's sake, remember that the act will be starting directly. I'll describe your feelings when I write the story. If you don't write it better than you listen to it, there's a poor show of a check, he complained. I say a fortnight went by. Then she wrote that she had read my comedy and was delighted with it. Look here, if you don't undertake not to speak another word till I've finished, I shan't tell you any more. Is it understood? I nodded. And for a spell, Orlando had it all his own way. 
She wrote that she was delighted with it, and asked me to call on her one day about half-past four. I could hardly believe my eyes. Really, it looked as if the monster's rancor had worn itself out. I felt tender towards the beast again, my affection revived. I said that it was like a monster in a fairy tale, transformed to a benevolent presence by the heroine. I thought that a pretty idea. I hoped I should get a chance to mention it to Miss Millar when I went. Of course, I meant to go the next afternoon, weather permitting, and I was so eager to see what sort of weather it was in the morning that I trembled when I pulled up the blind. Thank heaven it was raining. I breakfasted gratefully, and my only fear was that the sun might come out later on. Fortunately, it didn't. The drizzle continued, and all was well. By your idiotic expression, it's evident you've forgotten that the only decent garment remaining to me was a Macintosh. My suit was socially impossible. If it had been a fine day, I couldn't have gone. She lives with her mother in a top flat in Chelsea. When I was shown in, she was alone. Her voice was just as sweet as it was on the stage. She isn't a bit like any other actress I've met. She talks rather slowly, and she's very quiet. Even when she is enthused about the piece, she spoke quietly. I think it's beautiful, she said. I'm glad I asked you to let me read it. I nearly didn't, because... Because you didn't know my name? I said. Well, yes, she said. So many people write to one, and their pieces are generally so impossible. Is this your first, Mr. Lightfoot? My first? And it is threatened to be my last, I said. I've been copywriting it, and the complications have nearly ruined me. I had begun to feel myself another Frankenstein with a monster and then you turned the monster into a prince of light, like beauty in the fairy tale. It didn't go so well as I had expected, but she smiled a little. You'll let me give you some tea, she said. Won't you take off your Macintosh? No, thanks, I said. It isn't very wet. Then we had tea and cake, and got a bit forrader. She said she wished she had a theatre to produce the thing, and I said I wished I had an agent to place it for me. She asked me if I'd like her to show it to Alexander, and I said the English language would be inadequate to express the gratitude I'd feel. Of course, I added, she mustn't do all that for nothing, and she said she'd find it reward enough to play the part. I said pickles, then, quite naturally, because she was an exceedingly nice girl, and I liked her. I told her she should have any share of the fees she chose to ask for. Oh, nonsense, she said. No, it isn't nonsense, I said. It's only fair. Oh, well then, she said, if I get the piece done for you anyway, you shall give me the usual agent's commission. Does that satisfy you? We were talking quite chummily by this time, and I had another cup of tea. Before I went, her mother came in. Her mother didn't treat the commission so airily. Her mother wanted the girl to have a contract. But that was all right. I put it on paper for her when I got home. There was nothing for me to see her about again for two or three months. I had heard from her that Alexander had no use for the piece, and that Sir Charles Wenham had promised to read it on Sunday. Then she wrote that she was going on tour, and I called to say good-bye to her. There wasn't a cloud in the heavens, and I was still dependent on the Macintosh, but it couldn't be helped. I stayed longer that time. I could have stayed to supper if it hadn't been for the Macintosh. Of course, she went on working at the business while she was away, and she used to write me what she was doing about it. She was a regular trump, and I liked getting her letters and answering them, though the prospects never came to anything. At last, she wrote that she was coming back, and I called to say how do you do to her. It still hadn't run to a new suit, and I attribute a great deal to that Macintosh. It curtailed all my visits. I haven't had a fair chance with a girl. I had never loved before so quickly. I was fond of her already. I hope when you write the story, you'll bring her charm out strong. You had better send the manuscript to me, and I'll put in some of the things she has said, loyal, womanly things, without any grease paint on them. As I sat there that afternoon, sweltering in the infernal Macintosh, I knew I'd like to marry her. I knew that if the comedy ever caught on, I'd try to make my agent my wife. Well, when a production looked as far off as Klondike, there came this offer for the peace from Cameron, who had just taken the throne. 
she was as excited about it as i was the throne isn't quite the house i'd have chosen she said but you'll get a beautiful cast cameron will take pains with the smallest detail you'll be pleased with everything oh i mustn't answer for your leading lady i laughed there was no need for me to tell her i had faith in my leading lady you have given me a chance she said it'll be the best part i ever played if this engagement makes me i shall owe it to you there was one of the things without any grease paint on them wasn't it sweet she'd have had every excuse for reminding me all the time what a service she had done me we talked it over like pals she said that of course cameron would play the colonel himself and that he wanted to get fairfax for the lover who's fairfax i said i don't know him the lover is an important part all the pretty scene of yours in the orchard act will go for nothing if your lover is not good oh fairfax is a very clever young actor she said we have never played together but he has just made a great hit at the imperial i saw him there he was very good indeed well things couldn't have looked more promising cameron was enthusiastic he didn't pay any money on account but he gave me a cigar the percentage he agreed to was satisfactory and the girl i loved considered me her benefactor making a discount for disappointment i hoped for a hundred a week from the throne besides that there'd be the provincial tours and there were the american and colonial rights i had visions of a house in sloane street and a motor car then the expenses began again i couldn't attend daily rehearsals through august in the mackintosh so i managed to raise a pony on the agreement the interest was iniquitous but i was bound to have decent clothes and on the threshold of a fortune i didn't fuss i went to a tailor and i bought a two guinea panama and had eighteen pounds left fairfax turned out to be a plain young man with a big head and i didn't think so much of his reading as miss miller seemed to do however he improved she of course was divine and cameron was all right on the whole i was satisfied with the rehearsals dramatically financially they were a shock the luncheon adjournments upset my calculations i always had to adjourn with cameron though i'd rather have taken miss millar and cameron lunched extensively if a man stands you bollinger one day you can't offer him bass the next i had expected to enjoy the rehearsals but the eighteen pounds were vanishing at such a rate that i thanked providence when the last week came well by dint of missing a rehearsal or two i had contrived to cling to a fiver and i shook hands with myself i counted on it to keep me going till i got the first fees vain dream they decided to try the peas in worthing for three nights and i had to pay fares and an hotel bill old chap when i walked here to the throne on the night of the london production i possessed one shilling and that went on for a drink for the acting manager in the morning i hadn't the means to buy newspapers with the notices of my own play penniless i read them in a public library among the unemployed of course the notices bucked me up with an emphatic success i could smile at being stone broke till the hundred a week came in but it didn't come the box office sheets gave me the cold shivers when i saw them and the queues at the pit and gallery doors were so short that the niggers gave a playing outside the piece always went very well but there was never any money in the house the audience always looked very nice but none of them had ever paid they look very nice this evening don't they paper paper in rows paper in dreams a hundred a week by the first saturday night i reckon my week's royalties would almost cover the cost of my worthing trip and then i was optimistic cameron sent for me he said i'm afraid i must take this piece off at once the dressing room reeled i muttered that the notices had been good it's more than the business is look at the booking he said i hinted feebly that the best people hadn't come back to town yet he said well i'll give it a chance to pick up if in the meantime you like to waive fees i waved i heard him in a kind of stupor i've never had a bob Orlando paused. His head drooped sadly. I ascertained that the barmaids weren't looking, and pressed his hand. It's hard lines, I said. We must have another talk after the show. You won't mind my bolting now? The bell rang ever so long ago. The second act must be half over. A curse upon the second act, he burst out. Why did I ever write the second act? 
don't see it but i must see it i urged i want to see it what's the matter with it the dramatist was silent again i saw that he was struggling with strong emotion at last he said in a low voice the rest of the story so far as it's gone is more painful still perhaps you suppose that now it had stripped me of all and involved me in the meshes of a money lender the monster's malignity was appeased not so pecuniarily it could harm me no more but through my affections i was still vulnerable the monster's most insidious injury you have yet to hear i noticed during the rehearsals that fairfax was struck with miss millar and lately miss millar has shown an unaccountable interest in the big-headed fairfax i call it unaccountable because fairfax in his proper person can't be said to account for it she is always saying how tender he is in the part the part is tender i own the man can act but i gave him the lines to speak i invented the tender things for him to do she doesn't remember that consider what happened when i wrote the piece i imagined a charming girl in an orchard i imagined myself in love with her she had elsie millar's face she answered me with elsie millar's voice with all the tenderness all the wit all the fancy i could command i tried to make this charming girl fond of me materially i was producing half a dozen pages of dialogue psychologically i was lending my own character to any man who played the lover's part it fell to fairfax and it's all fairfax with her oh she has been very sympathetic about my failure we are still friends but there is another man now she talks more of his performance than of my comedy it's natural i suppose she understands his work better than mine but i deserted the second act you shan't see the second act the second act is the other man's glamour to her she is falling in love with the part and thinks it's with him the monster gave him his opportunity and he is stealing her from me with my own words talk to her as you have talked to me i said and hope still i can't help hoping he answered but an attendant entered the buffet with a note mr lightfoot sir orlando tore it open and passed it to me mutely i read dear mr lightfoot i hear you are in front tonight i have been waiting to tell you something all the week mr fairfax and i are engaged to be married and we owe our happiness to your play will you come around afterwards to let us thank you yours always sincerely elsie millar poor devil i exclaimed well the monster has finished with you now at any rate you know that you're disappointed in love and you know that the last of the expenses is over yes he said you think your editor will send a check for the story in overdue course i told him why well he moaned how am i to find the money to buy her a wedding present end of section 5 recording by sk edison new jersey